Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. Okay, there we right. go. All right, so I'm, I'm unmuted and um, I'm having two, two screens here. Uh, uh, Cameron, this is amazing. Of the 100 plus hours of rhinoplasty education on the internet that has occurred since uh, global lockdowns across countries, um, 22 or more of the best ones have been uh, through SORSA and your organizations and your leadership on this. You are redefining medical education in our specialty uh, and I think broadly as well. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, welcome also, um, gosh, so so many people that are, are, are online here speaking. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, honored to have uh, Jose Patricino, Holger Gasner, Ali Riza, Ms. Bahi, Roxana Cobo, Andres Gantus, uh, Philly Lopkakis. Uh, I'm sorry, I said your name wrong. Um, I'm sure I'm missing people because I can't read all the uh, the YouTubes. I mean, all the uh, the readers here, and maybe there's others on YouTube that are my friends that I don't see uh, as as well. Um, so we'll go on as, as we go forward here. Um, so this meeting never happened. It was the greatest meeting in the world that never happened. Um, disclosures are not relevant to this. Uh, please no recording or photography. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oren talked about piezos and other aerosolizing generating uh, devices. I wanna just very briefly, we could talk about this later. Uh, talk about the use of smoke evacuators. Uh, that's a smoke evacuator. Uh, OPA filter gets out 99.99997 of particles above uh, 100 uh, nanometers in size. Coronavirus is about 140 nanometers in size. This kills compared to uh, a HEPA filter, which is 99.997, and much better than N95, which is 95%. Uh, These are uh, widely available. I use piezos with this at hand. Uh, we studied that because I think this could train some of the practices out there. This is a computational model of the flow. So let's get back onto rhinoplasty here. Symmetry, shape, projection, rotation. Really, we're talking about how the nose looks when you see it. And what you're looking at are dark spots and light spots and shadows. Uh, so uh, in, in the words of, uh, of, for the Americans, Ron Burgundy, stay classy. Um, light reflexes, uh, tip bifidity, alar concavity, super uh, alar break and the infratip lobule. Dr. Friedman's talked about these. Really hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. You, you see it because it's obvious and these are all you know celebrities um, and, and you're just looking at the eyes. You're not really looking at the nose. Even if their nose does not look good, you're still looking at the eyes. And you see this obviously with, with, with men as well. You're looking at the eyes. You don't really, that's Johnny Depp 400 years ago. Um, you're looking at the eyes. So as rhinoplasty surgeons, our goal is to serve the ophthalmologist, at least from the front view. We don't want the nose to draw attention. Now, uh, Dr. Friedman had a, a, a big uh, talk on, 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 on aesthetics and then previous talks uh, in this series have talked about uh, the attractiveness of the nose. I don't wanna go through that too much in detail, but the analysis comes down to um, the frontal and oblique views, where I think the analysis is very complex, and the lateral views where the analysis is more simple, simply because uh, you're seeing something project into space. Now, the talk today is going to be on nasal tip support and projection, uh, but mostly about the surgical techniques. Um, the fact of the matter is rhinoplasty surgery is destructive. Contraction is a biological process that occurs over years and decades, Gravity uh, acts over a lifetime and setting a stable lateral profile is a challenge because you have these things that are acting over time scales that you will never see as a surgeon. Uh, so you don't really know your long-term outcomes. If you don't believe me, look at the people that, did, that had surgery done in the 1970s and 80s. They're having revision surgery now. And I'm pretty certain, even though we've made pretty high, uh, pretty impressive improvements in uh, rhinoplasty technology, uh, things things are still going to change. Now, uh, I don't want to go through too much of this, but uh, this is something I think across all all uh, organizations and board certification groups uh, in the world, you have to know these tip support mechanisms because you destroy all of them in rhinoplasty, whether it's through the endonasal technique or the open technique, uh, no matter how minimally invasive you are, if you're addressing the nasal tip, one or more of these uh, elements 
is going to be compromised. So the biggest part of it, in my opinion, is the intrinsic form factor and mechanical properties of the lower alar cartilage. And changing tip projection and altering tip support uh, you know, is a long-term problem issue focus of rhinoplasty. So a little brief, brief history of rhinoplasty and some of the first, first, very first uh, uh, tip projection preserving defining maneuvers uh, was the Goldman technique, which still people do, but it's not widely practiced because we know that in the wrong patient of which there are many, it has some very bad negative outcomes. And Dr. Friedman showed a picture of Irving Goldman through here. I was trained by one person that was trained by Goldman. So I know the te technique intimately. I don't portray it anymore, but it's dome division with an increase in projection because those medial segments come next to each other. And there are very many variants of, the, of dome division that are focused on altering projection and rotation by severing these, these structures. They're easy, but they're not necessarily the easiest thing uh, to master. And there's a lot of complexity to these, for, especially for long-term outcomes. Um, Columella strut uh, existed before open structure rhinoplasty, and it's simply a piece of cartilage that's interpositioned between the medial cura. Now, I think that, that uh, you know, this, this, this was m invented by multiple people, but the, the, the shift beyond the Goldman tip uh, was the dome suture. Now, this is probably the most cited article by Dr. McCullough, who is a gigantic figure in American rhinoplasty. Uh, the, the dome suture technique, of which there are many, many variants, and this is an early variant of, do of dome suturing, is incredible because it stabilizes the tip and it narrows the tip and it does improve the stability of the nasal tip because it's bringing two cartilage together, creating a composite structure like fiberglass. Two things bonded together are stronger. This is from Dr. Friedman's article ab about the dome suture, which can not only narrow the tip, but increase projection a little bit. Uh, more contemporary uh, approaches uh, to this are, are um, by, uh, 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 many authors, and, and they talk about the more precise placement of this dome suture being a little bit more cephalic so that you get this bifidity of the nasal tip. I'm, I'm going to, this is a video, but I'm going to skip it. The quality is bad. Um, the lateral curl steel is a variant of dome division. It's where you take from the lateral element of the lower alar cartilage and you bring it medially so that you can increase projection. And there are many variants to this, uh, how this is done. Uh, and uh, it is done with degloving and without degloving of the lower alar cartilage. This evolves into the concept of Jack Anderson, the giant of American rhinoplasty, certainly open structure. Uh, everyone from Russell Crydell to Dean Torium to Peter Adamson uh, traces their, their philosophic philosophy uh, to Jack Anderson and Calvin Johnson, of course, the tripod technique. And I think this was talked about earlier and it relates to the nasal tip in that with lateral curl steel or uh, that Dr. Crydell uh, had talked about, uh, had brought up and invented, um, you're shortening the lateral component, increasing the medial component, and therefore the nose rotates up. Now this is gonna be about tip support and lateral nasal aesthetics can be very, very subtle. Uh, and it, it's a lot more than just projection and rotation. And a, a lot of stuff is written on that. It's interesting that if you ever have the opportunity to look at a patient and their CT scan and render it, this is the patient and her CT scan, it's amazing what the soft tissue envelope looks like. And it's amazing what the bone looks like in these individuals. Now, the aesthetics of the lateral tip, and I don't want to go too much on this, uh, but Dr. Friedman covered things. And I think I want to focus on in, the difference to, in addition to projection and rotation is the break points, in particular, the super tip break and the infra tip break. Uh, we're picking on Johnny Depp today. This is his ex-wife or his second ex-wife or something like that. Um, this is a very good break point. There's about a millimeter and a half between the tip projection tangent and the dorsum of the nose. And there's a very nice attractive break here. And right here, you have an inflection point um, with respect to concavity and convexity. So tip support relates to optimizing the lateral profile uh, for me. And um, again, these features, which Dr. Friedman alluded to earlier and which you've seen in previous lectures in this SORSA series. Now, um, what I used to do, which is uh, still, I think, done by a lot of people, and I think it's a great technique, uh, was in the open structure technique, the Collier-Meller strut, the shield, and the cap, along with the domal sutures. 
And, and this was my workhorse uh, for, for about a decade. Um, again, the strut would go in here, uh, giving more support. It may or may not be uh, resting upon the nasal spine. And you had dome sutures, and you could do interdomal sutures as well, as well as the transdomal sutures. You could add stability to that process and also increase projection this is from Dr. Friedman's paper from many years ago. Uh, it's sad to say that because I remember this like yesterday and add a shield graft to add stability via open or endonasal techniques. And there are many ge geometric changes. So for me, these were examples of traditional, you know, other things are being done here, but cap, shield, strut, dome sutures, cap, shield, strut, dome sutures, cap, shield, strut, dome sutures. And um, I, I think this is a great technique. It works well um, and it's easy, but there is some a drawback to this in that there's a little bit of uncertainty overall uh, for overall projection because the tip does drop. There's nothing rigidly fixed and learning how long that, how much your tip will drop after surgery can take a very long time. Um, and it's much harder to predict that, I think, uh, the, the, on, on more aggressive techniques. Um, it's uncertain sometimes where that infratip lobular breakpoint is. There's a little uncertainty over that supratip uh, breakpoint. And again, depending upon the technique, wound healing dynamics, some comedy here. Okay, predictable and stable. All right, we need that. We could put a lot of other politicians up there now, given uh, the coronavirus, maybe about another 50. Um, 2006, uh, I haven't really used the Collier-Miller strut, shield, or cap graph as a principal means to increase projection and maintain tip support. So for me, what's predictable and what's simple? Now, uh, this is probably the most cited article on tongue and groove. Um, I don't think he invented it, but he certainly was one of the most uh, early proponents of tongue and groove, Dr. Crydell, who again is a giant in American rhinoplasty, global rhinoplasty. Tongue and groove is when you have an excess caudal septum, you can just suture the medial cura and other structures to that septum and lock in your projection, your rotation, every single thing. And it will stay like that for a very, very, very long time. But not everybody has this excess caudal septum. In fact, some people have a deficient caudal septum. What do you do? Septal extension graph, again, uh, wasn't invented by Dr. Toriyumi, but he popularized it more than anybody in, on the planet. And his paper in 2006 made the world change its axis. Everything changed. And this was introduced to the broad population of rhinoplasty surgeons, along with lateral curl strut grafts, um, advanced rim graft use, and, and a lot of other things. And the septal extension graft here, which is positioned in his diagram uh, uh, in a side-to-side -side fashion, uh, was transformative. And there are many ways to do this, and this is how I used to do them. I do them a little bit different now. Septal extension grafts can be end-to-end, -end, right in the middle there, secured to the caudal septum. Uh, septal extension grafts, uh, when done this way, can be used to control all of these lateral factors. Now, I'm going to show uh, in graphically before I hit examples how we can do that. Here's an example, um, a, a, a schematic of a computer uh, drawing. And there's the, in, the points that we care about from lateral aesthetics. And you can fashion a septal extension graph that follows the geometry of these red and uh, uh, yellow dots. And by the placement of that graph, again, define where those, those points are. The graph is then sutured into place. I'm one for PDS toxicity. I use almost exclusively PDS and I use a lot of sutures to reinforce that. You can make it bigger to project. You can make it smaller and define say the infratip point where that is. Um, I often do graphs that are shaped uh, like this boomerang. And uh, if it's right over the anterior septal angle uh, and it's a great way to get the infratip and the supratip precisely without using a lot of cartilage, I'll secure them with an extended spreader graph I'll secure them with little cartilage shavings that are four by eight millimeters or something like that in size, half a millimeter in thickness and suture that on. Uh, on occasion, rarely I will use uh, PDS foil, less and less with every day that passes for me using PDS foil. Um, caudal septal extension graph sets the lateral tip profile. Now, um, it, it's a, a really, really, really nice thing. Uh, I like it um, in particular because of the ability to control aesthetics. Now, there's two types that I use, a side-to-side, -side, which I think is easy, fast, very stable, but it has the risk of nasal airway obstruction, particularly if you have a very narrow nose. 
And in those cases, the end to end is a little bit better, in my opinion. It's a little bit more technically challenging. It takes a little bit more time. It needs to be stabilized with these side buttress graphs, but it's a very efficient use of cartilage. So we're gonna be talking about, uh, about this. This is traditional side to side. Um, and I fixate it with needles and then suture it in. And uh, I contour it with the skin soft tissue envelope flipped downwards. And I define uh, essentially rigidly where my projection point is, because that's where I'm gonna suture my dome, where my infratip break point is, because that's where a suture to the medial cura is. And where this part down slopes where my arrow is will, will define where my break point is. And you can do them a lot of different ways like this. Um, here's an example um, of a, a septal extension graph. And if this will play through here, the first thing that I do is secure with needles. And um, needle, please. I'll voice over with my, needles, my videos please. as well. And we might not show all of this just in the interest of time. So we'll, we'll put some needles through. And I usually like to put two needles in to secure it. This graft is bigger than what I need. It will be cut down and I will be millimeter by millimeter cutting that graft down to fit. And uh, I'll use PDS sutures to secure that through here. You don't need to see me suture. And um, you can see that. And then Thank I'll you. adjust it. Thank you. That's it. Based upon the size. Another example, same thing and suturing that in, in this case, securing it with an extended spreader graph. So um, a couple points, three sutures or more, I will use sometimes seven or eight. Now, uh, here's a case. It's a revision patient. I'm not going to show all the video. There's a lot of video here. Um, she, she has uh, some problems with projection. She's a little pointy on the tip. It's not rotated exactly. She's pretty. She's beautiful skin. Um, and it, the nose looks okay. I mean, thank God she's beautiful, but the nose could be better. There's dorsal problems as well uh, with her. And she has a funny problem with her ALA. She has a funny looking ALAR base and you know, she's not happy. She's not unhappy. She looks better. She has a lot of anatomic abnormalities. And what I do is put an, a, a septal extension graft, do dome sutures, and I'll do some other advanced maneuvers that uh, maybe we'll talk about later on in the Sources series. Uh, again, dome sutures, a septal extension graft placed here, uh, and then uh, the dome sutures. I'm going to skip the placement of spreader grafts, uh, but I will show um, the septal extension graft placement. This is not too long of a video. I think we got a little bit of time here. I think I'm about 17 minutes in through here. Um, and, and, you know, the cartilage isn't that thick, but it doesn't have to be because remember, you're building a laminated component that in some parts will be septal extension graft septum and medial cura and other parts will be septal extension graft medial cura and in other parts will be septal extension graft uh, and the domal areas. So I secure it with needles and I, I want to thank uh, Amir Hakimi for uh, doing an incredible job editing a mess. Um, this is the same video system that uh, Dr. Kobo and Werner Hept use. It's the, the Stortz uh, VTOM. It's an exascope. I have no interest in Stortz but uh, I videotape all of my operations now, every single one of them. Uh, I, uh, I, I videotape uh, uh, with the Stortz device um, and it allows me to adjust the, the, uh, the operation on the fly as well. And I put a lot of sutures there because you, you want to secure that rigidly and you don't want torsion or flexure. So you put a bunch of sutures in this area and secure it into position. And we'll skip ahead a little bit because we don't need to see all of these sutures. And then once that's in position, I will trim that graft, put the skin down and say, do I like my profile? And, oh, I do like it. So we're gonna go on next. Um, domal sutures, which are a, a key elements to, to, to this, um, are pretty easy. In this case, I'm gonna be doing a lateral curl uh, steel as part of a lateral curl tensioning maneuver. I've marked where my original domes are, and then I will mark um, where I want my new dome to be, because uh, I'm stealing, and stealing will, increase projection. And um, I, I like to do this. I like to measure everything, uh, not as much as some people, but I do a lot of measurements during surgery. And I, I dry off that little tip with some, with some gauze and I measure it up. Uh, and you notice that there's going to be, uh, these are, are perpendicular to the caudal border. That, that fold is perpendicular to the caudal border of the lower alar cartilage. Um, and I measure that meticulously. And then uh, I'll put sutures in 
Uh, I have an assistant uh, hold it exactly where the flexure point is. Um, and, uh, oh, going back a little bit, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, a little bit of a failure. I should show uh, the videos if I can, where I have it. And then I'll suture that entire complex, which has a transdomal suture in to the nasal tip and set my tip by fitity based upon where I place this suture up here. And this composite uh, of medial cura, septal extension graft is very, very, very stable. Now in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through the entire operation. These are very complex maneuvers on her. We'll just see the difference. A little bit better controlled, not perfect, but for a secondary operation, I'm pretty happy with the outcomes. Now, um, side to side is pretty easy, and that was side to side. End to end is a little bit harder because it's got to be in the midline, and you have to bridge this graph so that it has some sort of a of a of a connection between the the cura, I'm sorry, between the graph and the caudal septum. Uh, it can deviate too, so to have some of these bridge graphs in is important. This is a septal extension graph. Again, bigger than I need. I'm going to cut it down. And there are a lot of these little graphs that are less than 500 microns, less than half a millimeter in position that are holding it in. And I'll use all sorts of different geometries to it. Here's a, a piece of rib that I've contoured uh, to the caudal septum. And obviously, that's too big. I'm going to cut that down a lot. Here's another rib that I'm going to cut that down a lot. Another rib that I'm going to cut that down. Here's a revision patient. She's not happy with her outcome. Somebody else operated on her. I put a septal extension graph on the end. I did a lot of other things as well. Um, I've supported the septal extension graph with, with some other graphs. And um, the end result, just again, end to end is okay. And I'll go through a couple cases of this in detail. Another revision operation, uh, again, an end to end septal extension graph. They did ALAR base incisions and I should have been able to pull that ALAR margin up with direct excision. Uh, did not do uh, as well as I want. Here's a primary, uh, again, using an end-to-end -end septal extension graph, end-to-end -end septal extension graph. I'm setting the lateral profile in each of these. Well, another revision, end-to-end -end septal extension graph, primary, end-to-end -end septal extension graph. So you saw me do this sort of boomerang shape and geometry to the tip. I'm going to go through a case in detail so you can see this technique. It's actually easy. It does take a little time, but it is easy. And why I like to do this is you don't crowd the airway, you're right in the middle of, of, of the airway. And it's a conservative use of, of cartilage. So um, this, this woman is a hairstylist. Um, the best patient you can have is a hairstylist if you do a good job. It's also your worst patient if you don't do a good job. She's got a lot of stuff in here, but I wanna focus on the need for rotation uh, um, among other things. So we're gonna try to correct that. So I, I used a, a boomerang septal extension graft where uh, that's the septal extension graph right there. I actually make a template uh, using cardboard. And then uh, I'll show that in the next uh, coming videos of how I work, I work this. In the next video, we'll show this graph right. in position. This patient, uh, we have a septal extension graph that's hooked on in an end-to-end -end fashion here. She has a, a, a very acute angle in this area. This angle is softer. We're gonna do a very conservative lateral curl tensioning, lateral curl steel and then put articulated ALA rim grafts after we do intradomal, interdomal sutures. Thank you. And I'll go through the entire procedure now that you've seen a little bit of it on the next case. So in her situation, not perfect, um, but I'm happy. She's very happy. Uh, a little bit too square on the infra tip and a little bit too much fullness on the super tip. Um, got her back in midline. And uh, she's also can breathe, which is always nice. Now, um, the template technique, which I, I, I mentioned, is going to be shown on this patient here. Um, we're going to focus on, on the extension graph, not the other stuff, because this is about how I can achieve tip support and how you can reliably uh, through this. So she's got a lot of these problems. Uh, it's a very square, funny shape to this uh, infratip lobule at this point, and that's almost like a 110 degree, 120 degree angle between these. It must, needs to be much flatter, among other things. Um, it's an operation where uh, I did a septal extension graft end to end. I did dome suturing, among other things. I like rim grafts, but again, that's a talk for later on. Uh, it's an anterior approach to the septum. 
uh, an open rhinoplasty incision. I'm going to skip uh, the septal cartilage harvest and go straight in to uh, the, uh, the, the template approach. And I'm going to show this in detail. Is that better like that? It is. Okay. So with this marking pen, have one ready. I'm making a template for a uh, boomerang or end, end to end septal extension graft. You're making a, a little bit of a, of a smudge mark here that defines the border of the graft. So if we go over here, marking pen, sir. Thank you. Can you see that too? So we're putting a little dot right there. This is sort of the border of the graft since we're going to be going end to end. This is the border of the caudal septum rather. And our graft from what we see with this patient is going to have to, Brown Anson, graft is going to probably be very small uh, and bring her up to about right here, a little bit of rotation. So I don't need a lot. When I design these marking pens, I, um, I always err with too much projection and too much counter rotation. This is nowhere near the size of what we'll need. We won't need anything this big, but we'll start here with the template and then we'll trim downwards. It will not be anywhere near this large. Uh, and then we'll cut our template. And thank you. This is way over projected. So we're gonna then sequentially cut this down. And this is for, again, a, a graph that will be um, end to end. And you can see this sort of boomerang shape that it has. And again, I'm gonna over project it by a millimeter or two. And I'm gonna counter rotate it a little bit as well because once it's secured, I can always trim it down. Uh, likewise, I can always, uh, uh, I cannot always pull it up. Now where the bottom dotted line is, I'm gonna cut that out ultimately, but each time I do this, it lets me realign my caudal septum. So if I go like that and I look at her and I drop down, I ask myself, hmm, that's close. Maybe I need more, probably over projected, yeah? And let's see, it may, Need, may have changed the aesthetic a little bit. And this part is clearly in excess. And again, this is just a guideline. The template just gives you a little bit of an easier approach to managing that. So that's a little better to there. Now we're getting pretty much where we want to be. Uh, right through here. Let me just get that up. Get that right in line with what I want. And now let's see. How is that? Pretty close. And that's kind of what we want with this patient. Okay, thank you. This is roughly the shape of the graph. Um, some notes, when you cut your cartilage, I'm actually gonna, when I actually cut the cartilage, I'm gonna give myself a little bit more counter rotation in this direction outwards and a little bit more projection because it's still a little bit small. Uh, it's amazing how I'll pass right here. We have, um, this will probably be a spreader graph, this, this crest cartilage. It's not load bearing, but it does occupy space and it will be stable. It's going to be about 24 millimeters longer than we need. We need 23. This spreader is 22 millimeters longer than we need as well. So we can always extend it to embrace the septal extension graph. Articulated age ALA rim graphs measuring about 18 millimeters are in this area, mainly selected because of the contour. It's probably gonna be thicker than what we need, maybe not ideal. And then we'll have remnant cartilage around here. Note that with this cartilage here, um, the opportunity to get a little bit more caudal cartilage, uh, distal to that tip defining point in this direction where I'm touching and a little bit All right, so, and then securing it, I use a, a figure of, a uh, series of figure of eights. I'm not gonna talk about uh, piezoelectrics. Um, and here's that patient. Another case study, as, as we're winding down, um, this is a rib case. I, I'm not gonna talk about rib grass harvest. Uh, sometimes I'll use a piezo. Um, I use a special cutter that uh, uh, gives me very beautifully sliced segments. Uh, and here is a, um, 
septal extension grafting put in again with rib. What you'll notice here is the extended spreaders here, which are also stabilizing it. And with, with rib and major reconstruction and a secondary, sometimes that is necessary because you've already got a contracted soft tissue bed. And again, a couple before and after showing control of the projection. Uh, use of this technique in some subtle cases here. Uh, again, you're focusing on the super tip and infra tip lobule. Again, uh, you know, super tip and infra tip change is what we're looking at. A little bit of rotation. And you can get that precision using this type of a technique. A hard nose here, I found this very, very difficult for me because it's just a lot of strange anatomy. I wish it could have made it better through there. This is a very subtle case. This is actually a functional rhinoplasty with the, one of the worst septums I've ever seen, Z-shaped configuration. She didn't want really very much change in her nose. So I used an end-to-end -end septal extension graft because I wanted stability through there. So, um, you know, ending all of this uh, with, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, that technique with the, the septal extension graft, always make it a little bit bigger than you need because you can cut it down in situ. Uh, remember that you want to over project it and counter rotate it because you can always trim that cartilage once you have it secured and you bring down the skin soft tissue envelope. Uh, I like the template technique. I use a template as well with a, with the placement of a, a, a lateral uh, uh, side to side uh, graph as well. You need multiple sutures to lock that cartilage together to counter flexural and rotational uh, deformation. Uh, I, I don't use PDS that often. I, I, I don't think I've used it in about a year now. Um, if you need a little bit more projection, if you need a little bit more refinement on the infra tip, then some crushed uh, 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 cartilage is great for a cap graft or a modified shield type graft. And I think on all of these things, don't hesitate on a septal extension graft to start all over again if you're not happy and take your sutures out because um, you, you do your revision operation at the time of your primary. Uh, this is a shameless plug uh, for uh, uh, the guidebook for those that are taking the international examination. Uh, I wrote this because I had to take one of these examinations. Uh, so other people studied for me. Uh, Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Eh? Really um, excellent, excellent uh, talk as well. Yeah, I can see why you and Oren uh, put these world-class seminars together. So whilst we get ready for the questions, um, a shout out to everybody. Next Sunday night, it's all blefs. Okay, we're getting two talks on blefs. That's going to go out on social media tomorrow about exactly what it's going to be. But make sure you come back next Sunday to learn about that, re residents especially. So I'm going to jump straight in here. First question to Brian is um, from Patricia. Masal, what's like to know, Brian, how do you sterilize the cardboard you use to prefer prepare the templates? Uh, that's a good question. So one of, one of the things uh, in, in the United States, um, a lot of the things, the gowns that we wear are disposable, they come with pieces of cardboard on them. Um, so that's one. Uh, we, we use these things called cottonoid pledgets. They come with cardboard. So many of the disposables that we have in surgery come with cardboard on them. Uh, so I don't sterilize cardboard. There's always something in, in my operating room that comes with cardboard and I repurpose that. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, I see the CME link is up from Amir. Thanks for putting that on. Amir, if you could also just pop that onto YouTube. Some of the guys would like to see that link on YouTube. And then we've got a really good question here. So, Oren, get ready. You've got one of the big guys want to talk to you. Holger has a few questions for you. And this is very interesting, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> it says... Um, I found switching from endonasal to open not that straightforward as the medial tip recoil mechanism changes abruptly and the need for grafting increases exponentially. Any advice for the younger colleagues? Yeah, I, uh, I responded in the chat as well and worth repeating that uh, Holger, it's true. And I believe that that is the result of uh, the support of attachments from the skin, both internally and externally to the uh, car underlying cartilage. So the greater the number of incisions, the more loss of tip support. So if you're doing a transfiction incision alone, uh, hemi transfiction or complete transfiction, you still have uh, 
the main support mechanisms for the lower lateral cartilage intact. Uh, if you're doing a transcartilaginous, again, you still have two out of three uh, of the major tip support mechanisms intact. But once you've started on the path of endonasal, you've made your incisions, and now you're adding on top of that the external, the marginal incision, plus the mid columellar incision, you are sequentially removing additional support mechanisms for the tip. And so when you commit to make that change during the course of a single operation from endonasal to external, you have to be cognizant of the strength of support of the cartilage itself, the inherent strength of the cartilage, recognize that you've weakened it because you've taken apart additional tip support mechanisms given by the soft tissues. And so simply you need to add additional tip support. Uh, now, what does it take to add tip support? A lot of times it's cartilage grafting, as Brian showed, septal extension grafts, columellar struct grafts, uh, tip grafts, cap grafts. All of these add tip support. So do suture techniques. So just reestablishing, for example, the support. Let's say you did a transcartilaginous incision. I wouldn't hesitate to reattach the lower lateral cartilage to the upper lateral cartilage with suture or to reattach the lower lateral cartilage uh, or not reattach, but attach the lower lateral cartilage to the septal cartilage. Whatever it takes to stabilize those cartilage elements uh, to stable structures is what you're going to do uh, as, you, as you've taken apart some of those um, support mechanisms. So it's a change of philosophy again. It goes away from preserving structure, which is the philosophy of the endonasal. And once you've committed, you totally have to switch your philosophy. Now it becomes absolute structural grafting required. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, get, you get a shout out from one of the world's best endonasal surgeons, well, Ali Rez, um, says to you guys both great uh, lectures. Um, okay, so I've got a question, another one that's come up. So maybe both of you can answer that is, in terms of teaching residents, what would your preferred uh, technique be? Cadaver. <laughs> but I, I mean, the anatomy is is absolutely uh, uh, hard and amazing, and I think that's that's probably why. I mean, uh, ha having been taught first endonasal and then taught second open during my training, because uh, open structure rhinoplasty came out in publication. Uh, early 90s uh, during my training and I was learning endonasal and then open structure came out. Um, there was this exponential understanding of anatomy with the open technique. So I think it's easier for me to teach uh, open structure. But again, I'm, I'm not a master of endonasal like Oren or, or, um, or, or Holger, for example. I think it's hard to visualize cartilages. So I think that there's an advantage to teach through the open structure technique because you see everything. Or, or any comments from your side on that? Um, nothing to really add. I mean, I, I agree with what's been said. Uh, I feel like it's been said already. Okay, great. So uh, I've got a question for you specifically um, from Mohammed. He'd like to know, Dr. Friedman, do you use vertical dome division in your endonasal surgery or only rely on suture techniques? Uh, on occasion, rarely, uh, vertical dome division. That being said, I believe that in thick skin patients, I think it's a very excellent technique, including the way that Goldman described it, uh, taking from the medial crura to uh, increase tip support. So I don't have a problem with it. I think it could be done actually quite safely, um, especially if you uh, minimize incisions, because I believe the incisions provide excellent support. So for example, uh, take now the infracartilaginous approach exclusively. So not delivering, but preserving the scroll intact. Uh, and then if you want to separate the medial cura, no big deal. It's just an infracartilage incision. You still have the scroll intact. Uh, so to take those medial cura to increase tip projection, in particular in a thin skin patient where many of the potential for BASA and irregularities and contracture are reduced because you've minimized your incisions and transections of key support mechanisms, i.e. the scroll area, um, you're good. You have good support. Awesome. So I'm okay Thank with you. that. Yeah. Cool. 
Uh, okay, Brian, quite a, like, a, I think more of a beginner question for you is how do you carve septal extension grafts? What are the measurements and the shape? Well, I, again, it's, it's, a, I think that if you're starting um, using a septal extension, uh, I like to, the, the template technique, whether I'm doing end to end or side to side, because you're basically uh, putting a piece of cardboard in the nose to simulate what your graph would look like. And you can cut the cardboard a hundred times. And if you do it wrong, you can get another piece of cardboard, uh, sterile cardboard, and put that under the skin soft tissue envelope so that you can see the geometry of the graph there. Um, so, so I think that that's probably the easiest thing. You could certainly just suture it in and, and, and go on the fly. Um, that requires a little bit more judgment, a little bit more luck. And uh, I've seen live surgery where individuals have done that, uh, master surgeons, and have been short. And then what do you do? You have to have bailout techniques, um, you know, cap grafting and, and things of that nature, which um, you know, shouldn't be used except to maybe make changes in this technique of you know, half a millimeter, a quarter millimeter. Uh, so, so there's no sort of set size. I think the big question for the beginner is, am I going to do side to side or end to end? Side to side indications would be if the airway can accommodate the graft, meaning it doesn't be protrude into the airway. If it doesn't displace the tip off the midline, and that works for a deviated caudal septum. Uh, and um, uh, in, in another, another way uh, that you have adequate cartilage. Uh, and it can also enforce, reinforce the stiffness and stability of the caudal, of, of the caudal septum. If, it's, if you don't have those opportunities, it's got to be end to end. Okay. In many well, ways, another question. The cat. Sure. Okay. Another question for you is, uh, uh, Alessandro, so you were using a green glove on your patient's forehead. The question, what was the function for that glove? Do you use it with ice to reduce the edema? Well, uh, this is, uh, goes back to South Africa in that my, my mentor, uh, Roger Crumley, one of my mentors, had been mentored at the University of Iowa by Leslie Bernstein, uh, a giant in the American Academy uh, and also uh, uh, an expatriated South African. Uh, he trained so many hundred facial plastic surgeons uh, uh, in the world. Bernstein had, 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 had uh, through him, uh, it was take a glove, a sterile glove, fill it with uh, uh, crushed ice, tie the end of the glove off. And after you do your osseous work, put the glove over the dorsum to reduce any acute swelling. And I, I would say that I, I, I try to do that in most of my operations where I'm doing something where I think I can have swelling across the, uh, the osseous dorsum, in particular osteotomies. Um, so it's just, that's all it is. It's just a cool pack on the dorsum to eliminate swelling uh, that, that I also have them do that post-operatively. Um, Californians do not understand the concept of frostbite. So I educate them on what frostbite is and tell them 15 minutes on, five minutes off, 15 minutes on, five minutes off. And if a patient has grown up in a cold weather climate, then uh, I don't need to tell them that. They already know how to do that since they were little children. That's great. Okay. Uh, a question for Oren this time is how, from Durabi, would like to know how do you fix the spreader grafts through the endonasal approach? Is a zero degree endoscope a tool that you use? Uh, not typically. I don't use an endoscope. I like to create a very tight pocket uh, separate from the septoplasty uh, flap that's elevated. I keep intact at the high, at the, if this is the height of the septum, mm -hmm. then I will elevate the septal flap to do the septal work up until here. I'll leave intact some fibers uh, at the high point of that uh, septal functional work that's done. And then I create a separate tunnel above that intact floor for use as a spreader graft placement okay. site. And I, I can widen that by elevating a little bit of the mucosa off the upper lateral cartilage as well. So I create a, you know, really a three-dimensional space. Uh, it's very easy once you get a hang of it. There is a little bit of a learning curve where you'll pop through the septal flap at times um, as you're trying to create that hole or you go to the opposite direction of the septum. Uh, but uh, using a caudal elevator, the sharp end of the caudal, slowly create that pocket. And then it's a beautiful thing, really. It's a beautiful thing awesome. and, and it works great. 
Now, sometimes I'll fix it with 4 plain gut as part of my quilting stitch. If there's a deviation of the dorsal septum, I'll actually suture those uh, spreader grafts to the dorsal septum as well. That, that's hard. Uh, the hard thing to do, and I, I'm curious what Orin, uh, or anyone else's tricks are, when you, you separate the upper lateral cartilage from the quadrangular cartilage endonasally, put your graft in there and then suture that. I, I, that's, I'm not good at that. I can do it, but I fumble around with it. And that's probably one reason why when I, when I think I have a, a bad functional issue where I need a, a robust spreader graft, where, where I open, uh, for me, that mid-vault issue. So it, my hats are off to individuals like Ali Riza, Holger, and, and, and Oren that, that, that master those things. Well, a couple of tricks. So um, one is obviously elevating off the upper lateral cartilage like that creates a tight pocket where the spreader can't float above the level of the dorsum. If, so if you're able to ma maintain the upper lateral cartilage intact, uh, that works great. So for example, if through a standard dorsal reduction procedure, uh, you don't need to take off that much dorsum and you can actually leave the upper lats attached to the septum in their natural capacity, that works beautifully. Um, secondly, uh, if you use preservation techniques where you can preserve that attachment between the upper lat and the dorsal septum, but you wanna put an endonasal spreader, that opens it up to even more opportunity to use that spreader graft under an intact upper lat so it doesn't ride up high afterwards. So th there's some tricks that you can use. And then yes, to suture it in, if you've done a major, if you've got a major tension nose with a high dorsum and you have to lower the dorsum a lot with including separating the upper lat from the dorsal septum, yeah, then it becomes a little bit more of an issue. And that's where it's a bit neck breaking as you're trying to put those sutures in. But another trick mm -hmm. for that is if you keep intact the bone and you make sure that the spreader is long enough to lie under the bone, uh, under the bony uh, dorsum, so if the spreader can stay, that's one point of fixation. And then the second point of fixation with the suture can be at the caudal most aspect of the upper lateral cartilage, like an extended spreader graft. And then it's right there in view of your, of your uh, incision, if that awesome. makes sense. Yeah, that's great. So that, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, guys, we, we've got a couple more questions, but we've run out of time. We've already gone over time. And as per source of tradition, you know how these lectures end? Your top three tips that you want to give um, out to the, the participants tonight. Brian, we're going to kick off with you this time. Uh, wear a mask, don't spit, wear to use toilet paper. Um, no, I'm just, just joking because there's no more toilet paper in the United States. Um, I, I, I think the, the, the number one tip I'd say is, is, uh, is do your revision surgery at the time of your primary. That would be like the number one thing because if you're not happy on the on the table, you're not going to be happy afterwards. Be happy. Spend if it takes an hour, spend it because it's better than coming back for a revision. Uh, with respect to the topic today, um, you have to balance your selection of technique with what you're trying to achieve. How aggressive, how precise, uh, how precise you want to be determines how aggressive you are and understand your destroying mechanisms when you, uh, with every exposure. And I think the, the, the third very specific application is if you're using a septal extension graft, craft it to be a little counter rotated and a little over projected because you can always cut it down uh, in situ and, and, and contour it. Thank you. All right. Uh, first and foremost, remember nasal function. And so from that, I'll, leave, I'll give two tips. Uh, one is the septum is the primary uh, determinant of long-term rhinoplasty results. Number two, preserve the inferior turbinate because there is such a thing as empty nose syndrome and those patients are uh, uh, miserable and it is life altering to a negative extent. We're having a great time as surgeons uh, changing lives for the better. Uh, just like my philosophy in terms of the tip is, you know, first do no harm no need to overdo the tip, no need to overdo the airway. Just because you can drive a truck through it doesn't mean the patient's going to perceive good airflow through it. Um, and finally, uh, just have fun. Try the endonasal approach, try the external approach, understand the anatomy, uh, and that's going to make it all less of a tension, you know, less of a stressful operation and more of a fun adventure. Uh, we, we are in a great situation, all of us here, 
that we can do this magical operation that continues to keep us humble if we're honest with ourselves about our results, but keeps us wanting to come back to keep getting better and better results for the patients. So we're doing it for our patients and in the process, we're getting great satisfaction, uh, do it safely, start conservatively and just have fun. Awesome. Wow, lovely. Hey guys, thank you so much. It's a, it's really, it's a great honor for us to have you out here. Um, Unfortunately, not in real life, but uh, yeah, thank you for your time and thank you to all the participants from all around the world. Guys, it's just fantastic to be able to share this time with you. And next Sunday night, we meet again, chatting about blefs. And then the following Sunday, we're back into rhinoplasty. So have a great uh, rest of your Sunday, wherever in the world you are. And thank you again for so kindly logging into these webinars. Thanks, guys. Great job. Thanks, eh? Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.